All right, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Ankeny Area Chamber of Commerce and the Government Relations Committee, uh, we'd like to welcome you to tonight's House Candidate Public Forum. My name is Ryan Moon, and I am the Director of Government Relations and Public Policy at the Greater Des Moines Partnership, and I'll be mod moderating this discussion this evening. Uh, tonight, we have from State Representative District 40, we have Heather Sievers, from State Representative District 41, Ryan Weldon. From State Representative District 42, we have Representative Heather Matson, and we have Dr. Heather Stevenson. Both Representative Bill Gustav and Representative Molly Buck send their regrets. They had prior uh, work commitments that they already had on their calendar by the time this date was scheduled. Uh, Representative Buck wanted to share that she will actually be having office hours at the library uh, this Friday at 9 a.m. in the conference room D, and Representative Gustav is also accessible uh, to through his email to be able to contact him. I also want to add the questions we asked tonight. Uh, we will send to those two representatives, and they will have 24 hours to answer the questions and they will be posted on Facebook with the recording of today's event. We ask that if you are doing any type of recording or plan to use any type of recording, please record the entire forum to make sure nothing is taken out of context. And please note the forum rules and regulations that help us conduct a meaningful and respective forum. So I ask to hold all applause uh, until the end, and just hold all those. We can just keep those out. All right, we got that. Uh, at the partnership and, and through the Ankeny Chamber, one thing we, we talk a lot about is civility, uh, and especially in, in today's politics, but just overall civility uh, across our, our great state and, and country. Uh, something I've already uh, shared with the group that was mostly here already, uh, but it, it is not easy to run for public office. It is not easy, no matter what your position is, to put your name on a ballot. It is not easy for the candidates here. It's not easy for their family. And it's not easy for their friends. So uh, even if we disagree with what we hear today, I think that we should be able to show respect for people that are willing to do that. And I'm always appreciative of everyone who runs for any type of public office and service uh, because it is a challenging thing. So we appreciate you doing that. Uh, so yes, we ask to, to show that respect and to show that civility in today's forum. So how we will conduct uh, this forum is uh, we will first ask each uh, candidate for uh, to share their opening remarks. Uh, they will have 90 seconds, and our timekeepers are, are up here, uh, making sure you guys stay on time. And of course, I will be paying attention to and uh, I don't want to be rude, but if I have to cut you off, I absolutely will be to make sure that we treat this as fair as possible. Uh, and then, as I've already shared, uh, if you have any questions, with the, the Chamber has asked for questions in advance uh, to this, which I have in my pocket here. Uh, but there is also a great gentleman back there uh, that will take questions. Uh, if there's any questions that come up in the forum, you want to hand it to him, and throughout he'll come bring them up to me. Uh, one thing I ask is, if you're going to ask a question, please make sure you ask a question that everyone up here can answer. Uh, do not target a specific candidate or a specific issue. We just want to make sure that uh, we're asking all candidates of that question. Uh, for each question, I will again, yes, 90 seconds to answer the question. And then lastly, to keep everything the same, closing remarks for 90 seconds at the end. Uh, I do also want to do a quick reminder, and I'll remind everyone at the end, the library closes at 9 uh, p.m. I know we have a lot of good talkers in here and networkers, so if you're going to network and talk, uh, please make sure you maybe do it in the library parking lot. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and, and get started here. Uh, I'm actually going to start with uh, Dr. Stevenson, and uh, we'll, we'll work our, our way around our, our table here. So uh, Dr. Stevenson, uh, can you provide opening remarks, 90 seconds? 
Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you to the chamber and thank you to everyone who came. I, my name is Heather Stevenson. I'm running for Iowa House District 42. I'm originally from Iowa. I grew up in Carroll County, rural Carroll County. I have three children and my husband and I have lived here in Ankeny for about 15 years. I have a 26 year old daughter that my husband adopted. She works as a CNA in rural Iowa right now. And then I also have a 15 year old and 11 year old and they attend Ankeny Public Schools. After I got done with high school, I started working as a machine operator at BF Goodrich and Carroll and started taking night classes at DMAC. I finished my associate's degree and my, went to Iowa State to finish my bachelor's degree and my master's degree, and then I finished a doctorate from Maryville University about two years ago. After, I, um, after my master's degree, I worked in the state of Iowa in doing budgeting and contracting and child welfare and the juvenile justice system. I then stayed home for about 12 years and then returned to the workforce and worked at DMAC in, in Ankeny as an academic advisor. I now am a training consultant with Taro International, and I am running because I want to get results for Ankeny. Whether you live here or you own a business, I want to get results for the people of Ankeny and for the businesses of Ankeny. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Uh, Heather Sievers. Hi, yes, thanks to, thanks to to the chamber for putting this together, but I'm actually really excited to see this many people in here today. Uh, I really think it's very important for people to get to know the candidates so that you can make a decision that's right for you and your family and appreciate the opportunity to share and looking forward to hearing differences of opinions. And Ryan, I'm sorry you're outnumbered by so many Heathers tonight. <laughs> we got two Ryan, so. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. But I'm, I'm Heather Sievers and I've been in Iowa most of my life. I am a nurse by background. I went into mental health first, got my master's in counseling psychology, and then went on to pursue my master's in nursing and healthcare leadership. And so I love professions where we're focused on helping people. I've been an advocate in the community for my whole life. So my life changed very much when my husband and I had my daughter Rowan who was born with very rare disabilities. So being in Iowa, I'm very proud to live in Iowa and Iowa has shown up in so many different ways. The services and the public services that I value so much have really saved my daughter's life and created so many opportunities for her and I'm driven to protect them and that includes all of our public services, our unions, our schools, and I really want to build up health care services and mental health access for our people here in Iowa. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Representative Madsen. Thank you so much, Ryan, and thanks so much to the Chamber for hosting and for everyone for being here today. Um, my name is Heather Madsen. I am just finishing my second term in the Iowa House, representing about half of Ankeny. I am married to Chris Madsen, who's here with me tonight, and we have twins, Emma and Henry, who are freshmen this year, so they certainly keep us on our toes. Um, my focus is always on making sure that no matter where you live in this state, you have both economic security and economic opportunity. And I think both of those pieces are so important because to me, life is about more than surviving, it's about thriving, and making sure that all Iowans have the tools that they need to get ahead. So whether we're talking about strong public schools or access to health care, reproductive freedom, paid family medical leave, good paying jobs with benefits and retirement security, and lowering costs for Iowans, especially around child care and housing, these are the things that I have been working on, they are what I am passionate about, and they are what I will continue to work on should I be fortunate enough to be reelected to the Iowa House come next January. Um, my background is really about public service and public policy. I have a degree in government and a master's degree in legislative affairs. I've worked for nonprofits, for campaigns, and for corporations. My background in this community is very much driven by volunteerism. I am fortunate to serve on the board of the Ankeny Service Center as well as the Ankeny Kiwanis Foundation, and my heart is really with helping everyone in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Ron. Good evening, thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, have this forum to the chamber and thank you for coming to join us, uh, Ryan, first name. Um, well, uh, I've lived in Ankeny with my family for about 15 years. Um, my wife uh, and I have been married over 20 years here in December. Feels like time has flown by there. We have four kids. Um, my son's 13 and I have three daughters, eight, six, and four. 
So we are a busy household. Um, I have uh, I've worked in a lot of different uh, places. Um, I would when I started off at 19, I was in the insurance industry. Um, transitioned to uh, startup. Transitioned to uh, digital marketing and web development. Uh, transitioned to uh, another startup, and then to uh, the banking industry, the finance industry. So. Uh, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of experiences um, that um, every one of those has built into um, what I stand for and what I believe today. Um, and so I'm running for the House because I want uh, Ankeny to have rep Ankeny of representation um, and have uh, somebody that can work across the aisle and work with, um, with people to drive consensus and actually move the needle um, to make policies and uh, things that work for, for us here in Iowa. Um, you know, the main things that I'm, that I'm driven on are providing ec educational opportunity, um, ec economic opportunity, and then just uh, making sure that our community stays safe so that we can do business and play and work here um, in a safe community. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. All right, uh, like I said, these questions have been submitted uh, from uh, Indian Chamber members, and uh, how this will work, um, I'm actually gonna start with uh, Heather Sievers, and we'll just work our way around. Uh, it'll be the same question for each candidate. Uh, so to, to start us off, Heather, what legislative efforts would you promote to help small businesses in Iowa? Yeah, so actually I think, you know, I've, I've been doing research on this because there's a lot of small businesses that would stand up if they felt like they could do it and that it would be sustainable. So it costs a lot actually to purchase the commercial buildings. We have to be able to help continue to make the cost of purchasing those buildings or renting from those buildings to open those businesses easier. I know that inflation has really hurt a lot of people and we have done some things, uh, but I don't think we've been talking as much about small businesses at the state house that we should be. There's a lot more time spent on figuring out how to bring in large uh, state and foreign corporations and what those tax cuts look like for our people. Um, instead of really investing that same amount of energy into our smaller businesses. So one of the things is the people of the community know this best. You go into the community, you work directly with people who are already operating small businesses. You start with their personal experiences about what are gonna help them and you go from there. So this, then you can actually work on trying to create policy that's gonna support stand-ups as well. We have to incentivize small business and we have to support them to stay open and also be able to pay people livable wages um, for the people that they hire. Thank you, uh, Representative Madsen, what legislative efforts would you promote to help small businesses in Iowa? Thanks, this is a great question. I'm so glad it was asked. Um, I am fortunate to serve as the ranking Democrat on the Economic Development Budget Subcommittee. And that is a place where we do focus a lot on how we can help small businesses um, and businesses of all sizes across the state. Um, the things that I have advocated for include getting more resources into a lot of the economic development programs that we already have to make sure that even more small businesses and, and frankly businesses of all sizes can get more resources to stand up and grow and expand. But I think it's also important that we talk about a variety of needs, including workforce and how we make sure that our small businesses can have the workforce that they need and are getting those supports, which is why I have focused a lot on childcare. Uh, one of the pieces of a childcare bill I co-sponsored two years ago includes creating a small business childcare tax credit for businesses that provide childcare benefits to their employees. So I think when we're talking about how we support small businesses, we're doing it in a really comprehensive way. Another program that I love is at UNI, it's called the Family Business Center, and they focus a lot on how to help small family businesses grow, thrive, and work through succession plans and all of that. So as much as we can continue to help programs like that, that's just a couple of the things that we can do to support our small businesses. Thank you, Representative. Ryan. What legislative efforts would you promote to help small businesses in Iowa? Yeah, I think at a foundational level, um, we need to make sure that the businesses that, that are started and that are here have the workforce to uh, operate them. Um, and I think that starts with, a, with our tax base. Um, you know, I think that the efforts to lower the income tax is um, definitely a great start. And I think those legislative efforts need to be continued as well as I think we need to look at property taxes to make sure that people um, want to come here and live here. Um, 
there's there's also some great things that we could do to promote um, an entrepreneurial environment, um, not only here in Ankeny, but here in Iowa. Um, I think that making sure that um, people that want to start a business have the tools and resources to do so, um, and can actually see that it's a possibility to do it and without a bunch of capital to just start it up, I think that'd be really important to do that. Um, and so I think that creating that culture where people want to come here and live here um, and work here is, is foundational by reducing those taxes, but also uh, making sure that, that the business has the resources that they need to start. Thank you, Ryan. Dr. Stevenson, what legislative efforts would you promote to help small businesses in Iowa? Thank you for the question. Iowa needs to be competitive with both within our state and with other states when it comes to our businesses. Property taxes are very important when it comes to competition for space, and then those costs go on to whatever the cost is of the services that the business is charging for. One of the other things that I think we can look at is, I don't think that most people realize that a lot of our small businesses are paying more in credit card swipe fees than what they are actually have in profits. So the average U.S. merchant pays 2.25% in credit card swipe fees, which is seven times more than what they pay in Europe and five times more than what they pay in China. And at the state level, if we didn't allow credit card swipe fees to be collected on taxes that, are, that the business is required to collect for the state, then that money could stay in our business's pocket and get reinvested into our state. Thank you. Uh, Representative Matz, I'm going to start uh, this question with you and we'll work way around again. Uh, what are your thoughts on property tax legislation that has been enacted over the last couple sessions? Great question. So, okay, so the property tax stuff over the last few years, um, there are some pieces of it that I've liked, some that I've had concerns with. I think one of my biggest concerns over property taxes lately is that no one ever actually seems to realize a meaningful decrease. Like there's always efforts to lower property taxes, uh, but it doesn't seem to really meet people where they're at or make a big difference. And I think that's in part how it's done. And my concern too is that over the years as we keep doing these decreases, then it's putting big strains on our local governments in being able to meet the needs of their communities, of their residents. And what we're seeing over time is that these communities are having to look at ways to increase fees, add other charges here and there. And so my concern is that if we keep doing these decreases, then we're actually make it, making it harder for residents and for communities to get the supports that they need, and we will just find another way to pay for that through niggling and diming of fees. And it's also important to remember that every cut is also an expenditure, so let's talk as well about how we're actually investing in our communities and focus on maybe lowering costs as opposed to just the tax cuts. Thank you, Representative. Ryan, what are your thoughts on property tax legislation that has been enacted over the last couple of sessions? Yeah, when I'm out knocking doors, um, this is definitely one of the things that comes up almost every time. Um, people are worried about property taxes. They want to see they want to see some more things that are done. Um, you know, and talking with folks that are on fixed income, especially our retired folks, that uh, maybe they're you know they have their houses paid off, and um, and they have a tax bill that comes up. And I guess the thought that, that runs through my head and the question that I ask him is like, if you, have a, if you have a property tax bill due at the end of the year, um, but you can't pay it, um, who, actually still, who actually owns your home? Is it you or is it the government? And that's, I think that's a question that we need to wrestle with. We have, uh, we have folks that have paid their houses off, they live in our communities, and if we, if we were gonna really want to attract workforce, if we want to attract retirees, I think it's definitely something that we need to look at. Um, um, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm pro uh, property tax reform. I think that um, also what we can, what we need to do, and what needs to be looked at is, um, you know, the, the folks um, in the in the communities and in the counties that are, are spending the money that the, pro that the property tax uh, money is funding, um, and the, the initiatives that that's funding. Um, I think we need to ask them and, and look at what what are they spending it on, um, because I think you know there's definitely some. 
some questions about is it um, is it an income problem or is it is it a, an expenditure problem? And so I think that looking at that to make sure that the, the things that we're spending mo money on are actually effective and efficient and wise. Thank you, Ryan. Dr. Stevenson, uh, what are your thoughts on property tax legislation that has been enacted over the last couple of sessions? Thank you for the question. Property tax reform would be my number one issue that I would be concerned about. There's a lot of things that go into property tax reform. We need to focus on the spending side as well as the collection side. But property taxes get passed on to homeowners, they get passed on to renters, they get passed on to business owners. So it affects every single aspect of our life, what our property taxes are. Iowa has one of the highest property tax burdens in the country, and it is a barrier to home ownership and people on a fixed income. It is a barrier to them being able to stay in our state because if you're on a retirement income and you wanna stay living here next to your grandkids, but you can't afford your property tax bill, then you're gonna move somewhere that's cheaper. So I think that property tax reform is multifaceted and it affects a lot of different aspects. Thank you. Heather, what are your thoughts on property tax legislation that has been enacted over the last couple of sessions? Yeah, so I think, I, I really do agree with everybody. I think that we have to continue to do reform and I think we have to be really careful. So I'm not somebody that believes in any extreme legislation we have to make sure that we're having balanced tax plans, not just looking at property taxes, but all taxes and the impacts to the families and the ones that need the most support. So I hear this at the doors too constantly. This comes up all the time, but I also think it's a cumulative problem of the impact of our economy right now with all of the inflation that we're experiencing. So this cumulative effect makes the property taxes feel even that much harder to pay. So I do think that we have to you know, work with our city councils. I agree, you have to have a balance on both sides, make sure that we're investing smartly in the development of our towns. I know the 3% cap with growth that rolled out has been hard on the cities. It's hard to manage the budgets, primarily in towns that are growing like Altoona and Ankeny, for example. Um, but I think our city councils do a really good job. And I think we need to trust our city councils to use that money really wisely. Um, but I do think we need to take the weight off, off on property taxes and continue to, re to reform those. But we have to keep property taxes at a level that's gonna support our police, our fire, make sure that we have good roads and parks and that our cities are taken care of and we're investing in the development that our cities need to, need to see and so that we can have a quality place to live. That matters to people too. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna start with Ryan and, and work our way. Uh, Ryan, what is your plan to ensure our nursing homes are safe and adequately staffed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's definitely not something that uh, comes up very often um, when talking with, with voters. Um, you know, I think that um, attracting healthcare professionals and the workforce is, is really important. Um, you know, I think that, especially in our rural communities, um, that's definitely a problem, is having enough people um, to support those facilities um, and uh, make sure that the, product, the services that they're providing are accessible. Um, so I think that, that we need to uh, you know, incentivize the culture where we are um, recruiting and maintaining um, and supporting the, you know, the current staff as well um, to, to do that. Um, so um, I, that, those would be my initial thoughts um, for that right now. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Dr. Stevenson, what, are you, what is your plan to ensure our nursing homes are safe and adequately staffed? I am so glad you asked this question. I'm part of what you call the sandwich generation, where you have aging parents and you still have young kids at home. So this is a very important question to women my age. Our nursing homes are doing a lot of work that are helping people and women my age with our parents and we have a shortage in CNAs, we have a shortage of nurses. We have really good programs right here in town in DMAC where we've got a nursing program that creates nurses and they go to work inside those, those systems. We have a year long wait list to get into our nursing program here at DMAC. If we had more space and more instructors, we could create twice, we could employ twice as many nurses in our state just in that one program. And we've got those programs all across the state. We also have really good programs like Last Dollar Scholar that the state has created, which if you want to go to college and there's a job for you in the state of Iowa, you can go to a place like DMAC and the state will pay for that, that education. However, a CNA does not qualify for Last Dollar Scholar because it's not an, a full accredited program, it's just one class. 
So I think we could do more scholarships for CNAs because that one CNA class that usually costs somewhere between $800 to $1,000 allows our residents to get a good job in a field that is needed and they can go work anywhere. So my daughter works as a CNA in rural Iowa and it's hard work. It is hard work, but it is good pay and you can find a job anywhere. Thank you. Heather, what is your plan to ensure our nursing homes are safe and adequately staffed? This is going to be hard for me to answer in 90 seconds, I'll tell you. But as a nurse and as somebody that is very involved in this space, there's a lot of things that are contributing. One of the things that I've witnessed is issues with the privatized health insurance companies not being held accountable to paying for services. So nursing homes do not get coverage for a long time. So a lot of people require Medicaid coverage towards the end of life. Medicaid only reimburses a third of the cost of services. We also have delays in start of care for people. People who have contributed to the workforce their whole lives and are no longer able to pass anything down to their children, I have a real problem with that. We need to have the insurance companies paying into these facilities. We need to have adequate survey, in-person survey, to make sure that the quality of these organizations are good. We have to focus on reducing turnover, so I do believe we do have to create some of those scholarship opportunities, but the turnover in these facilities is immense because of the extreme low pay. I see people at the doors a lot who can barely pay for their groceries and pay for their rent. There's choices that are having to be made for jobs that are extremely difficult and that we need so much. So we have to invest in these living wages and hold people accountable to paying for the services that all of us are paying into right now and people deserve to be taken care of at the end of life. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. All right, we're gonna jump over to, to Dr. Stevenson for, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Representative Madison, I did not mean in three Heathers. I knew it was gonna slip up one time. I got one slip up, all right. Representative, what is your plan to ensure our nursing homes are safe and adequately staffed? Right, I was gonna say that. I was like, I've been scribbling notes. I'm ready to talk about it. Uh, no, but thank you, because it's it really is an incredibly important question and one that is also top of mind for me. Um, as Heather Stevenson mentioned, she's part of the sandwich generation, and it won't come as any surprise that I am also part of the sandwich generation, um, raising teenagers and helping care for elderly parents. Um, my mother actually was in skilled nursing for a month earlier this year after a fall that broke her hip. Um, she now utilizes home health um, and there is a lot going on there. But I would say that this issue is very personal to me and it's something that I have also tried really hard to work on. And I was proud to co-sponsor, or not sorry, not co-sponsor, vote for an amendment last session that would have actually allocated more resources to monitoring and review of our nursing homes. And it was voted down by the Republican majority. And this is happening at a time when we know that we are not meeting the needs of Iowans in our nursing homes. And I found that actually kind of unconscionable. I agree a lot with what Heather Sievers has said about the need to raise pay, how incredibly important that is, how hard that work is. And I do believe that we need to be working with the federal government on the standards that they are putting out rather than fighting them um, as our state government has chosen to do. Thank you, Representative. All right, let me try this again. Dr. Stevenson. What legislative efforts do you propose to counter the effects of inflation? Thank you much, so much for the question. I don't get to write it down because I'm going first. You know, I think one of the things that we can do at the state level is again coming back to property taxes. You know, if whatever we can do to keep more money in the pockets of people, more money in the pockets of our businesses, so they can keep it local and reinvest is what I think the state can do for inflation. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Sievers, what legislative efforts do you propose to counter the effects of inflation? This is really complicated and it's gonna take a lot to address this, but it has to be multifaceted. So one of the things that we've already briefly discussed tonight is childcare. We have to make it affordable so that people don't have to choose between a paycheck all going to childcare, staying home and raising their children. 
So I do think we need to make some of those high cost things more affordable for people so that they can stay in the workforce. But we also need to get to a point where we figure out incremental changes to increase livable wages here in the state. We cannot continue to stay at $7.25 an hour, which is why a lot of other businesses have already tried to work on ways to at least get people up to $15. So we have to figure out incremental ways to do this in a time of inflation, but we do, we've done it before, we will figure it out and we need to get it to a point where people can actually buy groceries. We have options, but we need to make sure that we're holding you know, grocery stores accountable to bringing down some of that price gouging that occurred during COVID. Prices went way up and they stayed up, and we have to figure out ways to bring those back down. I really do feel like we have a lot of things we need to do at the state level, and one of the other things too is if people, if you end up having a car breakdown or, or cost of goods and things like that to be able to fix things in your home, sometimes that breaks the bank. So I do think we need to continue to look at what's gonna to take to make our housing more affordable as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Madison, what legislative efforts do you propose to counter the effects of inflation? Thank you. And. You know, I really wish that inflation was something we could deal with at the state level because wouldn't that give me so much more to talk about at the doors when someone brings up inflation as the thing that they think needs to be dealt with. Um, but I will say that in response to that, what I always say is we need to focus on what we can actually do at the state level to help folks get ahead. And to actually help them, I think the best thing we can do is focus on lowering costs and one of the things that the state government is perfectly situated to do is to incentivize the behavior you want to see. And so for me, those two pieces have really been around childcare and housing. I mentioned a piece of a childcare bill um, that I co-sponsored a couple of years ago. It is a comprehensive bill that works on tax credits for actual providers of childcare as well as help for families to pay for childcare. Um, there's a whole host of things that we can do there. And then another thing is housing. Housing is fundamental to a person's economic security and is something that we need to do more of. 23% um, of Iowans are cost burdened by housing or severely cost burdened. 20% of renters are cost burdened and another 21% are severely cost bur burdened. I believe that we can do more on affordable housing programs. I've co-sponsored legislation to do just that, incentivizing development of affordable housing, as well as working on rent stabilization, which is something I would love to talk more about if I were not getting this outside. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, what legislative efforts do you propose to counter the effects of inflation? Yeah, I mean, first off, um, at a foundational level, I just don't believe it's the government's job to make, make businesses pay more or bring down the cost of goods and services. I think what we can do is that we can bring down the, cost, the amount of money that we're taking from businesses that we're taking from private individuals and get that money back into their pockets so that they can reinvest in the community and drive economic growth. Um, I think there are things we can do at the state level and that's around um, lowering those taxes, working on property tax, um, and then just creating creating more business opportunity by attracting more businesses, helping small businesses get started. Um, you know, and if we, were, if we were to increase the cost of, what it, of, of uh, an employee, say, by increasing the, the minimum wage, that is essentially another tax on businesses. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna pass that cost along to their consumers, it's gonna make prices go up, and essentially we have the same problem. So what we need to do is support our businesses, support our private, um, citizens by helping get the money back in their pocket. Thank you. All right. Heather Sievers, we're going to start with you on this next question. Is school safety an issue for schools in the district? If so, how can it be improved? If not, what do you think is working? Yes, so I have, definitely have opinions about this. So we have seen an increase across the nation, actually, um, around issues with school safety. And there's also a lot of fear in our schools right now. I was not very happy after the Perry shooting that legislation from the State House came forward to bring more guns into our schools and armed teachers. I talked to a million teachers. They all said that they would not feel safe or comfortable using a gun, especially if it was on a student. That does not solve problems for increasing the safety in schools. We actually should be investing that money back in 
to mental health services, preventative care, as well as making sure that the schools are safe, zero point of entry. The police agree with me, I've spent a lot of time talking with them about this. We need to actually build resource officers, which is something that Polk County does so well. Sheriff Snyder is an incredible advocate for our school systems and continues to build resource officers in our schools that are housed there and build that safety in that community. We need to be spreading that across the state and investing in those programs that improve safety and do not normalize guns in our schools. There's a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Representative, is school safety an issue for schools in the district? If so, how can it be improved? If not, what do you think is working? Thanks for the question, and absolutely, yes, it's a concern. Um, I'm a mom, and I have two teenagers in school, and this does hit home very close every time you hear of something awful that has happened. I 100% support SROs in our schools. I love that Ankeny has them, and I will continue to support that. I also think it is important for school districts to have local control in what they decide to do as far as SROs go, excuse me, SROs go, but it is something that I personally support strongly. I also think it's important to recognize um, that as the Perry shooting came up, um, the first people on the ground in Perry to help besides first responders were the AEAs. And Heartland AEA in particular was there to help make sure that transition plans were being made to make sure that families were safe, the kids were safe, all of these pieces. And unfortunately, what the legislature did last session was gut them. And so I certainly would wanna make sure that we are getting back on track with our AEAs so that they can be a part of school safety decisions moving forward. And I do think it's important that we focus on common sense gun safety I do not believe that more guns in schools is the answer, and I think we need to do more around red flag laws with strong due process in place to make sure that guns do not end up in the hands of people who intend to harm themselves or others. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Ryan, is school safety an issue for schools in the district? If so, how can it be improved? If not, what do you think is working? Yeah, uh, I was on the Ankeny School Board here uh, from 2019 to 2023, and so school safety is definitely something that uh, was worked on while I was there. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of SROs. I think expanding SROs is a good idea. Um, and there's also some, some really easy, like common sense stuff that, um, that can really improve the response time. I mean, um, at, at a foundational level, um, communication during a crisis is, is paramount. Um, you know, so per making sure that the schools have the appropriate radios that can um, communicate during that situation is, is important. I think that also um, having um, um, entries and exits that are clearly labeled and that buildings that make sense so that when um, a police officer shows up in crisis, they know exactly um, where they need to go because everything's clearly numbered and, and they know exactly what the floor plan is. Um, I also think that um, when we talk about school safety, um, you know, Rightfully so, we think a lot about um, about guns and things like that, but um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is our cybersecurity at our schools. Um, I think that um, we need to make sure that our student data is appropriately um, safeguarded, and um, I, I know that um, there's some, definitely some things that we can do um, within the schools um, to improve that without getting into the details. We did an audit um, when I was on the board, and. Um, there's definitely things that, that we need to look at when we think about our school's data. Thank you, Ryan. Dr. Stevenson, is school safety an issue for the schools in the district? If so, how can it be improved? If not, what do you think is working? I also have kids that are in public school, so I don't know that you can wake up every day and send your kids to school and not think about school safety in the day and age of today. You know, our schools are safe until they're not. And I think that we need to make sure that we're fully funding the things that the schools say that they need to be safe. They say they need cameras, they need to be funded. If they need entryways so that they can be locked, they need to be funded. I fully support SROs in our school, our school resource officers. There's a lot of other people that are in our schools that act as quasi-resource officers. And I think we could have more of those you know, we have juvenile court school liaisons that are in schools and sometimes trackers who are in schools who work with kids that 
are um, involved in the system. So just having all of those adults in the building, knowing what's going on, helps with that environment. You know, I, I don't know if there's one answer, but I do think that we all go to school shootings, but I think there's a lot of bullying and other things that are happening in our schools that we need to address that are even not the worst of, of the situations. So just making sure that we have the resources, have the adults in the building. I would like to see more associates in our schools so that our teachers have more support so that they could teach and then they had more people in the classroom to help them deal with those situations. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Representative Madsen, we're gonna start this question with you. How would you improve access to affordable health care? Thank you for the question. There are so many pieces of the health care puzzle. It's going to be impossible to answer in 90 seconds. Uh, but I will say that I serve on the Health and Human Services Committee, and I also serve as one of the legislative board members um, for the um, Council on Health and Human Services, which is the overarching policy board of the department, and so this is something that I care deeply about. Um, we need to be making investments, quite frankly. Um, the waiver programs in particular um, for Medicaid, for things, the home and community-based waiver, excuse me, home and community-based services, some of the disability waivers have wait lists of over five years for kids who desperately need services, and adults for that matter too. So that's something that I think that we need to focus on making those investments. We need to be making sure that we have resources for our critical access hospitals so that we do not continue to see more hospitals or labor and delivery wards specifically closing around the state. We can expand telehealth. And I think that we really need to focus on how we're going to invest in our healthcare workforce um, because, quite frankly, that's one of the biggest issues um, that we face in the state is having healthcare des deserts. We are 50th in the nation when it comes to the number of ob guides per capita in this state. Um, and until we are doing a better job, in my opinion, of welcoming more folks into this state, um, we are gonna continue to struggle in this regard. Thank you, Representative. Ryan, how would you improve access to affordable healthcare? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we, we have, like, Representative Madison said a lot of a lot of issues um, that we can we can address. I mean, but at the end of the day, if people aren't going to work in the field, we're not going to have act, we're not gonna, people aren't going to have access to it. And so, I think that making sure that we can fast track we're not fast track, but help people get certified in the, in the ways that they need to get certified, help their degree programs to be accessible and affordable, um, but also incentivize those programs that get people to move here and that want to live here. Um, that's definitely something that. We need to make sure happens because the, the workforce problem is really, really the, the main thing that's driving this. And so uh, making sure that we, we can do that is would be my main priority. Thank you, Ryan. Dr. Stevenson, how would you improve access to affordable health care? Thank you for the question. I know you're asking about affordable health care, but I think that I want to focus on access because we need to make sure we have access to health care. We all know that we have a shortage of OBGYNs in a lot of our rural areas or not having service providers, but we also have another thing that's just coming over the horizon. In between your pharmacy and the uh, pharmaceutical companies, you have pharmacy benefits managers, and those pharmacy benefits managers are called PBMs. They have contracts in order for your pharmacy to be able to fill your prescription. You have three companies that control 80% of the market in the entire United States, and they're not allowing reimbursement rates at a level so that our pharmacies can actually keep their lights on or pay their staff, much less be reimbursed for the wholesale cost of the medicine because they want everyone to have to get their medicine through uh, mail order. So if you lose your pharmacy, you can no longer get your flu shots. You can't get now over-the-counter um, birth control pills as a woman. So we need to make sure at the state level that we are looking at the commercial insurance industry and making sure that our pharmacies are getting reimbursed at a level so that we don't have a pharmacy desert as well as a healthcare provider desert. Thank you. Heather, how would you improve access to affordable healthcare? So people have covered a lot of things, but I, I wanna dive into areas where I think that we've actually created problems with some of our legislation around 
So let's let's start with Medicaid because my daughter utilizes Medicaid because she has rare disabilities and she's going to need this for her whole life. So one in four people with disabilities in our state are living in poverty, but it's because they don't have access to health care when they enter the workforce. So you either have to choose between keeping your health care insurance as someone who's already struggling with disabilities or, or work and lose, this, lose that access to health care. So one of the first things I want to do, and I'm going to be talking to the disability forum tomorrow night in the same location, is working toward legislation that allows people with disabilities and things that they cannot control to maintain their Medicaid longer so that they can enter into the workforce and hopefully get out of poverty. I also believe that one of the big things that we have to do is focus on seniors. So pharmacy costs are high. We have a lot of people who cannot actually afford hearing aids or basic needs things as they move into later life. There's a lot of people who can't even think about retiring right now because they can't afford to take care of themselves at a time when you have the most health care issues. So we have to be working on our Medicare and Medicaid systems at the state level. The private companies, I, I have a passion to make sure that we are holding some accountability for reimbursement. Hospitals add on costs because the insurance companies only reimburse for part of the services. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. All right, Ryan, we'll start with you. What is your position on the Students First Education Savings Account Program? What changes, if any, would you propose? Yeah, um, well, I, I believe that an educational opportunity um, for all students um, to have access to the education that, they, um, that works for them. Um, you know, I, obviously I was not in the legislature when the when that was, bill came around, and so um, you know this is uh, something that um, you know I want to dive into um, and, and look at more as we as it gets rolled out um, and be able to analyze and see how how everything's working. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, their education educational opportunity is at the heart of this, and I think that um, there's there's definitely students that thrive in our public schools. Um, and there are students that don't um, take a, take a program like starts right here down in Des Moines that their their main focus is um, on students that they weren't going to finish high school because the the public schools were failing them um, and so this program meets them where they're at and provides educational opportunities in a way that they can they can learn and they can graduate and they can thrive after high school and so I think that providing educational opportunities is um, is a bedrock to making sure that our students are successful um, in life after after education. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stevenson, what is your position on the Students First Education Savings Account Program? What changes, if any, would you propose? Thank you. As Ryan said, I also was not in the legislature, so I did not get the opportunity to vote on that. Um, I do think that our private schools are doing some of the government's job of educating our students. Their parents are paying taxes. And because they're educating our students and educating our future workforce, there's probably a good argument to say that some of that government money should go to them. They're not receiving any of our, our property tax dollars. So I would need to look a little bit further into that before I had an opinion on that exact program. But I do support, I support education and not every system works well for every student. And we need to do a better job of having systems and programs that meet students so that they can get educated. If you know a class of 20 to 30 doesn't work well for you, having other options. I think here in Ankeny, we've got a really good opportunity with the Innovation Hub to look at alternative forms of education. And I would like to see more of that, you know, and, and at the same time, make sure that we're funding our public schools. Thank you. Heather, what is your position on the Students First Education Savings Account Program? What changes, if any, would you propose? Students First is an idea. It's not actually what our legislation is doing for our communities. So there is so much money in the pot for our student supplemental aid. These programs are presented as though this is actually creating more access for children to have a school of choice. However, our private schools who can afford what they have already, most of the people using this program are 
actually already in private school. So next year I have an even bigger concern because there are no restrictions, no income limits, and the private schools continue to increase their tuition. All of this money that's going into the private schools is draining out the bank with absolutely no restrictions, no limits. The private schools are not being held accountable to the same things that public schools are being held accountable to do. And so if private schools are gonna be using public money, then they need to be held to the same accountabilities for accreditations and also for reporting how that taxpayer dollar is being spent. But I also, when you look at this program that continues to take out of the pot, which last year, the last couple years alone has already been $365 million of the money that used to be supported into our public schools. We have lost so many public schools in the last 10 years. The next year is gonna be even worse and public schools gets whatever is left in that pot. So year after year, they've already been underfunding our public schools and we're feeling that way under inflation. The Democrats last time asked for them to just give the same amount, give the same amount to, to the public schools as they were giving to the private schools and it was shut down. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Madsen, what is your position on the Students First Education Savings Account Program? What changes, if any, would you propose? Well, it'll come as no surprise if you followed my voting record that I was a strong no on the voucher bill and I continue to oppose it. I believe very strongly that public education is a social contract. One that we have as a state, one that we have as a country that we decided a couple hundred years ago uh, that we were going to, as, as a government, as a people, as a community, um, that we were going to educate our kids to further our democracy and also make sure that our kids were learning how to be with other kids, right? That's just a piece of it. And my biggest concern, honestly, about the voucher program is that it is a, in my opinion, a solution in search of a problem. We already have school choice in Iowa. You can choose to send your kid anywhere you want. The question is whether or not we can pay for it with our taxpayer dollars. Um, it is an unlimited line item in our state budget, meaning that even though the public schools, for example, get a certain amount that they are allowed to take in and spend, and they can't go over it, no matter how much they need that money, the voucher program is an unlimited line item, meaning that if your family applies for it and you qualify for it, regardless of how much money has been appropriated by the legislature, you will qualify for the program, you will get the money, and then the legislature is gonna to have to go back and find more money, and that money is gonna to have to come from somewhere, our public schools. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Dr. Stevenson, how should the state work with the federal government on immigration? I had not anticipated this question. <laughs> you know, I, immigration is important for our workforce. We have a lot of immigrants that come into Iowa to, to work and go to school and to study. So I think we need to have a good relationship with the federal government when it comes to immigration and what that looks like for our state. I do think that our state also needs to know who is coming into our state and we need to make sure that if they're here, we have the ability to support them in housing and education and that we have the infrastructure to support um, people who are coming here. So, you know, I, I would hope that the state has a bigger voice than it probably does when it comes to immigration because, you know, when anybody moves here, you need to be able to support them. Thank you. Heather, how should the state work with the federal government on immigration? So this is really complicated too, and I know that this is a heated topic for a lot of people. There's only certain things that we can do in the state, right? We can, we, we need to focus on people who are already here. So some of the things actually, I was at the Seattle School Board yesterday, our schools could actually use support to help um, develop uh, English learners. So there's resources that are needed at the State House. We actually have limitations for how long we support coverage of services and we're having a significant increase in, in kiddos that are coming into our schools that have uh, language needs. We, we need to be building up programs to help build that diversity. I believe in diversity in the state. I also believe that immigration is something that built America. I do also think that there's a lot of challenges right now 
And I do think part of the thing is when people come into our state, it's taking a long time for people to actually get into the workforce. So I think whatever we could do with the federal government to start uh, building in resources to speed up people's ability to actually get into and contribute to our workforce is a key thing that I would want to discuss. Thank you. Representative, how should the state work with the federal government on immigration? It's a great question, and generally speaking, I support any efforts between the state and the federal government working together to solve problems rather than exacerbate them. That's always where I want to start from. I think it's important to remember, as has already been said, you know, there is, <clears throat> generally speaking, little to nothing that the state can do on immigration that is very much a federal issue and is federal jurisdiction. But as also been said, we have, it is, it is understandable to recognize that there are there can be increased challenges within communities and I think that what we can do at the state level is help meet those needs as Heather also said so whether it is talking about yes getting more funding for English language learners or focusing on more housing making sure people can afford housing all of those pieces help our communities and meet needs where there are challenges and making sure that we are a welcoming place, um, I think it's really important for our communities. Thank you, Representative. Brian, how should the state work with the federal government on immigration? Yeah, it's heartbreaking um, talking with folks at, uh, at the doors who have come here um, as immigrants themselves, um, have taken you know, 20 years by, by their choice to become legal um, citizens of the United States um, and uh, and tens of thousands of dollars just to just to get here and, and get that citizenship and earn it um, and and yet um, they're seeing that people can just cross the border um, and not go through that process right now and they're getting more assistance and more help than they ever than they ever did and so I think that um, what we need to do right now with the federal government is help help hold them accountable to ensure that legal immigration is what we're doing and not just letting people across the border and flood into our state and increase the criminal activity and increase the drug usage and fentanyl that it's, continues to come into our state. And so I think that um, when working with the federal government, uh, there needs to be a collaboration, but it needs to be, it needs to be both sides. We, we need to have the same goals. And so right now, we just need to hold them accountable and ensuring that uh, our, our country is actually vetting the people that are coming in and helping them go through the process legally. Thank you. Okay. All right, so that's concluded our prepared questions from our, from our audience, so uh, thank you. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and do 90 seconds of closing remarks, and we're gonna start with Heather Sievers and, and work our way around. So uh, Heather, I'll give you 90 seconds for your closing remarks. For all the really good questions tonight, it was a diverse group of questions as well. So I appreciated that, and thanks everybody for um, sharing your honest opinions. So I did not plan on running for office this year. One thing that I will say is, and I've said this in other other responses, that I do not believe in extreme legislation. I truly believe that we have to figure out how to bring people back together. We need to find a balance of power in our government. And we have to be focused on things that are not extreme, but actually bringing people together that are gonna benefit more people across the state. So when the ADA was actually broken apart, when our schools were underfunded yet again in the public sector, and also teacher pay was pulled into it, I think there's a lot of political games going on. I wanna get in to help people. I've been advocating for people, and I want to see a government here at the state level that actually is listening to what the majority of Iowans want. We should be voting the way that the majority of Iowans are asking us to vote. So I think there's a lot of political agendas going on right now that I have not been very impressed with as I've been down at the Capitol. And I think it's time for that to change. We need good Republicans, we need good Democrats, we need a balance of power, and we need to be working for the people and the things that they're asking for. I think we need to be spending more time in the communities, talking to the communities, writing legislation in our own state and not paying out of state interest groups to write that legislation that we've been passing. We need to be listening to the people 
and writing legislation that they're asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Representative, 90 seconds. Thank you all so much for being here and for the excellent questions. This has been such a great conversation tonight. I'm honored to have been a part of it. You know, I, I picked out this necklace for a very specific reason today. It was a gift from the Interfaith Alliance of Iowa um, from back in 2019, and I was really fortunate to serve on their board of directors for a number of years. One of their goals, among many, is ex ending extremism in our politics. And I think that it is abundantly clear just from, I mean, just turn on the television, you guys, we all know it, um, the amount of vitriol, the amount of extremism that is out there right now. And I believe so strongly in building community, in reaching out and understanding where other people are coming from so that we can actually do a really great job in the legislature and meet the needs of the people in the state. It's part of why I hold office hours every Friday morning during the legislative session so that anyone can come in and talk to me about whatever they want to talk about. It's why I put my personal cell phone on my door knocking cards and on my website so people know that I am truly accessible to them. And I think it's important to mention that, you know, regardless of whether or not we agree on every issue, I want you to know that I will always listen and I humbly ask for your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Brian. Yeah, thank you so much, all of you, for coming out and uh, spending your evening here. Um, I can about imagine all the things that you could be doing right now. Um, you know, I just want to end up by just making it very clear who I am. Um, I believe in individual freedom, fiscal responsibility, state sovereignty, capitalism and the free market, limited government, doing everything we can to help secure our borders, stop illegal immigration, and strong education that allows parents a choice of where to send their children. I will protect our freedoms by applying constitutional principles, and I will vote for legislation that will put money back in your pockets by providing tax relief, creating jobs, and helping small businesses to grow. But that's just a start. I'd love to hear from you about the issues that matter most to you and your family. So let's work together to build a brighter future for Iowa. Vote Ryan Weldon all the way from tomorrow till November 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Dr. Stevenson. Thank you so much for tonight. I just wanna end with, I think the best way that we can create long-term results for our community is by strengthening re relationships. And our first relationship was with our family. So when we're enacting government policies and deciding legislation, we need to make sure that we are not trying to replace the family and that we're doing things that encourage family relationships. We need a social safety net that does not replace that family. Because when the paid government workers go away, your family is still the ones that you go to. I am the same person at the door as I am at the grocery store or at an AJF football game. I promise to represent you with honesty and integrity, and I would love to have your support. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we did such a good job, y'all. So let's give them a nice round of applause. <laughs> On behalf of the Ankeny Area Chamber of Commerce and their Government Relations Committee, we just want to thank again the candidates uh, for joining us this evening and uh, for the public. And as a reminder, yes, voting starts tomorrow. So uh, I, I heard when you vote, the commercials stop. So uh, <laughs> fact check on that. But no, as a reminder, voting uh, ends Tuesday, November 5th. To find your polling location, you go to the Iowa Secretary of State's website or your county auditor's website. Thank you all for joining us this evening.